Yes, sir. All right. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2016. Afternoon session. We're going to be hearing from, once again, a conference favorite. Uh, he continues to wow us with his technology and his presentations. And he also is a fantastic resource and just a great guy to talk to, discuss technologies, and he helps young inventors rise up through the ranks and teaches them the ropes. He's a great man all the way around. I would like to present to you Moray King. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. And he, he did explain. I, I, for some reason, just brought John Fiala a fruit cake. And I know why that happened. So as I was preparing my talk this year, Gene's a little high, um, I, I was flooded with more and more information coming at me, and I had to, uh, eventually had to break it up in, into a, uh, actually three talks this year. And so I didn't even know if a slot would open up. And last night, uh, the Red Sea parted, and I got, I got that slot for the big talk. Um, and this was an offshoot. I was inspired by the research that I was doing uh, to, to look at nano cavities and holding plasma in nano cavities. Um, so the research inspired me, and then I thought, nano cavity plasmas, uh, like plasmoids, ta tap the zero, zero point energy. Now, um, I guess you've heard I'm a real big enthusiast for microscopic ball lightning. And I said, wouldn't it really be real cool if we could trap it, trap it in material? And, and if it's stuck there, it doesn't dissipate, if it's especially if it's a dielectric material. And then you could just start electrically interacting with it and basically make direct electricity machines. It would amplify the machine. And uh, the, the, the idea was originally inspired by the tubes of T. Henry Moray, who, who I really studied. I wrote a book on him. And uh, I'll cover some inventors that I really believe that's what's happening in their device. They're actually trapping nano cavity plasmoids or microscopic ball lightning in the material within the device. Uh, the, when I was studying the, the nanobubbles, they were getting really, really meticulous at uh, uh, carefully studying. They could trap nanobubbles in graphene films and, and study them with a microscope. And that's how they've learned they're so stable and, and are learning their properties about it. And this is a hot area of research. And I kept focusing on that and thinking, gee, what if you could just trap nanoscopic plasmoids in material? Uh, imagine like a nano cavity surface, kind of like graphene that could trap it. And then all of a sudden have a nano cavity ball lightning. That, that was the inspiration that kept coming to me as I was doing the research. Is there any evidence? Well, there is. Fractal emission, when a crystal is cracked, it emits light. And sometimes that light can persist for hours. It's called fractal emission. Um, they see it quite a bit with metallic glass. It really sparks when they, when they crack it. So it's well studied. It's recognized in, the, in, in standard science. And it's like, like the earthquake lights, ball lightning coming out of a cracking fissure. Or when an earthquake occurs, the fissure opens up, and people have seen ball lightning coming out of it. And it's the same thing happening just at a microscopic level. And Ken Shoulders was really really believed he's making EVs whenever fractal emission occurs. That ball lightning would persist. They had the characteristics of EVs. They kind of got trapped. They couldn't run off, off the dielectric. And they kept emitting light and energy. And so he was basically using this explanation, fractal emission, to explain low energy nuclear reactions, L-E-N-R, uh, were caused actually by EVs from the cracking material. And whenever you load palladium and superload it um, uh, during the electrolysis process when they were doing the cold fusion experiments, it typically cracks. And it's the cracking event that's associated with excess energy. Ed Storms did a two-part paper in Infinite Energy magazine this past year, narrowing it down to the cracks. He says, I know it's associated with the cracking of the material as he studied across the whole field. And Ken Shoulders said, yeah, I wrote this paper a number of years ago, teaming with Jack Serfati, that says, I'm making fractal emission 
plasmoids. I'm making the EVs from the cracks, and those EVs are causing the transmutation events, the anomalous events that they're seeing in the cold fusion experiments, and basically tapping the zero point energy. The source of these LNR anomalies and excess heat, and especially transmutation, are coming from zero point energy, essentially the EV strikes on the material. And they have evidence of the boreholes on the material. It's, it's just like EV strikes. So uh, I, I, he doesn't, Ken Shoulders never made a lot of noise as far as advertising his idea. But I said, that, you've nailed it, Ken. You've nailed the explanation for the cold fusion experiments and the anomalies associated with LENR, low energy nuclear reactions. Yeah. Are there any evidence in, in inventors, from inventors? Floyd Sparky Sweet, you guys heard of him? Extremely famous because his invention was so simple. It was very simplistic. I'll, say, I'll show what it is in a moment. Um, basically, some coils, a piece of barium ferrite. He could create the energy anomaly. It would self-run. He could hit it with a nine volt, little nine volt uh, battery, just spark it, and the thing was closed loop self running. It was a spectacular invention. I got the privilege of, of meeting with Floyd Sweet at his home one on one for a three hour talk, just him and me talking qu very quietly. And I said, Sparky, why don't you share your secret with the world? It was all about conditioning this material to make it happen. And, and, and you're about to die, he had a bad heart, he's in his, in, in his mid-80s. And um, he said, if other people could do it, what would they need me for? He could just never release the secret. Right? And uh, so I knew he would be lying in a little bit. Uh, I couldn't necessarily trust everything he said because he didn't want uh, to disclose the secret, but the secret was conditioning the material. Uh, this was the engineering team that Tom Bearden gathered around Sparky Sweet. Oh, very, very competent engineers. Walt Rosenthal, in particular, was, was brought in to stabilize the device. He's an electrical engineer who's going to use solid state circuits to help with the switching and get control of the, the exciting the machine. And there was one other that was a very significant contributor that I personally met. And I will tell the story in just a minute on this one other person. The device is very simple. There's a couple slabs of conditioned barium ferrite. Barium ferrite is like a magnetic material, right? Its domains don't really like to shift very much. It kind of acts like a permanent magnet all, all the, all often time. There's a couple coils on the side, and there's a couple coils sandwiched in between. And Sparky says he could get the anomaly just with one slab. He just only needed one piece of barium ferrite. Two was a lot better to stabilize the device, but he could get the anomaly with it. Now, a lot of people have tried to, to get it because, uh, and that's where all the research is, is, go, is um, about. And so this is what Sparky shared with me. Basically, the coils on the side are exciter coils. They just get the, the barium ferrite excited such that the magnetic bubble or the magnetic activity shifts back and forth real easily. And now it's very important. Now it's very difficult to do with um, the material with barium ferrite because the magnetic domains do not like the shift. It's a, it's a permanent magnet material. And this was the clue to me that nearly every researcher was focused on the magnetic domains and shifting those. And, and I know that material doesn't let them shift. Excuse me. And this is what the domains look like. Uh, they're not aligned north-south going through the face. They're all tilted over, especially near the periphery. The magnetic fields are, are, are kind of flat. And here's what, what happens. They actually wiggle quite easily. I'll go back to this. When the exciter coil, the, the, the whole magnetic field wiggles. It, it quivers. And uh, when you can do that, that's getting the first base on the sweet device. Very few replicators have ever done that. The pickup coil was by Filer. It was meant to pick up a counter-rotating phenomena from the, from the face of the magnet, like, like two counter-rotating vortices. 
and he would get the cold current off the bifilar winding. So the currents would, would respectively be going opposite directions on each of the wires at the same time. And so that's weird. And, and of course, the device was considered to run cool. Here are the domains. So what I wrote up in my presentation for that conference in 1994 was this hypothesis. Instead of shifting the magnetic domains in the material, what if we rotate the grains, just the little grains embedded in the material, like grains of sand, of ma magnetic material, and get those to shift? And basically, they would just freely rotate. If you could condition the barium ferrite, you could kind of loosen up some grains, and those would be uh, being able to move. And you start to move them synchronously, and now you get the idea of a moving, a moving magnetic phenomenon that moves very, very easily. And so I wrote this hypothesis. I was forced to write the paper before I went to the 1994 conference. We had a speaker's retreat. It was very nice. Um, the, we, uh, the paper had to be written and submitted, so I did that. It's, it's in my book, Quest for Zero Point Energy. And at, at that conference is when I met that mystery person, Don Watson. Don Watson jumps in the car with Walt Rosenthal, crashes the retreat, and he, he was poor, didn't even have any, any food. He crashed in, in, Don, in Walt Rosenthal's uh, hotel room. He would beg food from other people at dinner. So I gave him half my dinner that first night, and boy, did I get a story. What Don Watson did at that retreat, he got everybody interested on his, what he did with, with an experiment that he was doing, and prior to even hearing of Sparky Sweet, he impressed everybody so much, he was invited to join Mike Watson at that conference and, and give half the presentation, because Mike Watson was wanting to report on the Sparky Sweet project, he completely failed in his replication attempt, he actually had nothing positive to, to report, and Donnie Watson had something spectacularly positive to report. And what did Don Watson tell me? He said, prior to ever hearing of Sparky Sweet, he got a kit from Edmund Scientific to do the uh, uh, high temperature superconductors, and he had a doer of liquid nitrogen. And he had some barium ferrite blocks, and he would dip it into the liquid nitrogen, and then put it on top of a Tesla coil, turn out the lights, zap it with the Tesla coil, and he liked watching it glow in the dark. He was playing. He's just fooling around. It's like a kid that just got his chemistry set, and he goes, I wonder what would happen if, and you start mixing everything. He's playing around, and what he was able to do when he did that, he was able to move what he called a magnetic bubble, this green paper that's used for imaging magnetic fields. Right, he could put that on top, and just a very weak magnet from the side, if he just rocked the magnet back and forth, that bubble would quiver. So unconditioned barium ferrite can't do that. And so what he had was, he had, he had the critical, critical uh, piece to the puzzle, which was he dipped it in liquid nitrogen and then zapped it with a high voltage pulse. And it was later on that he heard about Sparky Sweet and eventually told Walt, Walt Rosenthal, and Walt says, you've got to come to the conference and share, and share this. So he was the first one to be successful in replicating the conditioning process of conditioning the barium ferrite. And so basically, in the conditioning, most, of, most is known, ex except for the, the freezing part was unknown. But everything else was known. You sandwiched it in about 20 kilovolts DC between a couple of plates. Uh, he would kind of condition it with a bifilar coil, really weird, in a bucking configuration at 60 hertz. And, and, you, and you go, there's no net magnetic field when you do that. Now, if you do that with a normal coil, that's typically used to race magnetic material, trying to erase the, the domain alignment. But here he's conditioning with bifilar with the currents so that the fields buck each other, so it's a scalar-like phenomena. To, to excite it, so it's kind of weird. And then, uh, then he gets a big pulse from a, a capacitive discharge, a very abrupt pulse on the pulsing coil, and that's what imprints the domains in a certain way. And also, that event is what gives the quivering magnetic bubble. 
So that was what Donnie Watson had to contribute to the science of this, is, is the trick of freezing the material. Uh, I thought that we were gone on once Sparky died, and uh, they tried a replication projects with no success. Donnie really didn't interact with them on that replication project. And, and I thought the whole thing died until I saw a YouTube by Brian Ahern. Uh, it was at the MIT uh, Cold Fusion Conference uh, in 2014, and it was a, a spectacular YouTube, and because he found another inventor who actually succeeded in replicating the sweet device. And this, the inventor was Arthur Menelis. He was on the East Coast. And he heard of Sparky, and he, he was playing with it. And he finally replicated it. He used it to charge a battery in a car, and had an electric car that he kind of um, made himself. And he was able to keep the car going uh, by recharging the battery with the sweet device. And so from Brian, Here's the slide of his conclusion. Are you able to read that? I, if you can, I'll just read it. This is the final from his YouTube. The ferromagneti ferromagnetism is a cooperative phenomena. Ferrites processed at 3 to 12 nanometers have cooperative oscillations. So we know something small is oscillating in there. Uh, magnetic vortices arise at that dimension. So he, he's, he's still focused on magnetic fields. Uh, vortex interaction extracts energy via energy localization. Ferrite transformer cores run cold, as he observes the cold effect. Any energy source is undetermined. He should come to the Tesla conference. We'll tell him what the energy source is. So uh, these, are, these are other web links that I really thought from Brian Ahern uh, that really explains a lot. And, and you don't have to... Um, copy them down because you're going to get the slide deck. I'll have the slide deck up on the web. And so you get all the, all the links through that. And so nano cavity ball lightning. Are there any other projects out there that are doing it? What about this guy? Have you heard of this guy? Oh my gosh. This YouTube, a three hour YouTube, were, were, it, it was like a graduation ceremony. He has this little free energy machine and all the diplomats of the world come and if your country promises world peace and, and not to wage war again, we'll give you a free energy machine. It was like a graduation ceremony with everybody applauding as they were marching up one by one, getting their free energy machine. And it's noteworthy that all the diplomats, all the countries sent diplomats except two, the United States and Israel. And I think those countries just figured well, we'll just conquer our neighbor with war and take their free energy machine. <laughs> then we can keep waging war. <laughs> so uh, his, his heart's in the right place. I think he's channeling or something because he talks in this flowery way, these microscopic suns and the material. And I'm thinking, you know, nanocavity plasmoids. As he says that, that's what I'm thinking. And I says, well, maybe he's inspired with this idea. You know, they... Uh, when they can make the system, they do this carbon nano-coating and this, this conditioning process and everything else that, that's being done on the project. And, and their YouTube's up with people trying to do, it's all open source, do the work. It doesn't, nobody's reporting success, right? And there's some cute YouTubes where they're meditating to it and hoping that it'll arise with energy, you know. So it's, it's really weird. So, so thus, he does, he has a poor reputation with the inventing community because they did try it, and there's plenty of information for replication uh, with meticulous detail, and, but I haven't seen any successes uh, reported back. And so there was one thing missing, the high voltage discharge. He never talked about doing that. I said, this was obvious to me. If you want to get the ball like you start it, you got to zap it. Everybody zapped stuff to get it started. No, and he never said that. And nobody is out there doing that, not doing that. I said, this is, it's obvious. And then once you zap it, triggered an action, then you keep oscillations on it to keep it going. So maybe uh, word will get out that you have to use a high voltage discharge. And I guess you should say, well, duh. <laughs> So to wrap up, uh, the nanocavities, lots of ways to make them. Graphene's a popular material. I think, I think the, the, the holes in just between the 
inside the carbon hexagon is a little too small, right? You need, you need, uh, you need cavities a little bigger to trap the plasmoids. But that was, certainly was the inspiration, that study, uh, to, to do it. They know there's fractal emission when the crystal cracks, and Ken Shoulders used it to explain low-energy nuclear reactions. Uh, here's some of the inventors that I think were really doing it. The Floyd Sweet Project, and I actually think uh, Meh Mehran Kesh is doing it too. That's the intention of that device, is to make nano-cavity plasmoids trapped in the soot that's on, on the conductors. And if you do that, the, the, that appears to be like a solid state energy machine, right? With all those little nano-cavity plasmoids mimicking the T. Henry Moray plasma tubes. And, and all in solid state, and if your circuit interacts with it, uh, if you are tapping the energy, the oscillations will grow as you interact with it. So the future of our energy is nano-cavities hosting nano-plasmoids. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have, um, the books are out there on the tables, and that's where you can get the, the copies of the, of the slide deck all the slide decks that I presented on uh, since 2007 can be downloaded from that website. And every slide has um, the references where I got the material on the web. So I left plenty of times for questions. And if anybody got a cache device to actually work, step up to the line first. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. And any questions from last night, please bring them on over and we can get them on tape. All right, it's from the second row. Here we go. This is just one question. It's a follow-up from last night. Would you go over again the creation of the plasmoids within those nano bubbles as they as they collapse, or I mean, just briefly? Could you summarize that in like a couple of? Okay, summarize minutes. when the nano bubbles collapse uh, uh, into a torus. Yes. And and why it makes ball lightning. Yes. Okay, so. Uh, when a plasma discharge typically hits a little droplet of water or, or any structure, it usually blows apart, right? But if it's small enough, the plasma force itself, as it surrounds it, starts to do a pinch, pinch and it pinches it into a torus shape. And then the plasma in that torus shape can now have a vortex ring, like a closed slinky on itself, uh, circulate around it and stay there to make ball lightning, you need a symmetrical template for the plasma to form around. It just doesn't form up, out without a matter template to guide it into the torus form. And, and thus, that's why it's happening on, on the <coughs> droplets up, up in the fog particles, you know, up in the thunderclouds. Na nature's actually doing that. It's doing it all the time. So thunderclouds are an example of tapping the zero point energy. If I were an engineer and I was capable of transmitting how to do the physics, I wouldn't go to Meran Keshe's group, the S Spaceship Institute, to be in the videos to give th the key, because, and I just came up with this 10 seconds ago, so I'm testing this hypothesis, like, I'm happy that he's giving a platform that's active, that's a matrix for the conversation for the world to mature. What does it mean if we're a society or a planet or a cosmos where free energy and uh, plasma physics takes its place for the Earth? So I think it's remarkable that they're gathered as a community and it's an international fabric of people, intentions and actions and relationships into the governments and then you know I'm looking around the room many of us could have gone and worked with them and it didn't happen yet so I thank them for the work that they're doing so that human beings in their multiple different stratifications of beliefs and com competence and structures of power and and the struggles in power structures it's a beneficial thing that human beings could mature the relationship to power sources and to 
the kinship and the intimacy with black holes. And I don't know what you guys think about that. No, well, I could comment. Um, I think um, the gist of, 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 of at least what, what I heard you, and I resonate with this, is, is that we, we have an opportunity for unlimited energy. Right? And I'm limited to, to come to humanity. And part of having that is the maturity to handle it safely. Right? We, if we just go and weaponize it, we'll just destroy ourselves all the faster, right? So there's a certain maturity that goes along with it. And, and I think around Kesh, a lot of kindred spirits say, you know, if mankind realizes we're all connected being and we stop waging war, we can basically be gifted of uh, unlimited energy. And it'll, the gift will come through our, our spirits, our minds. People channel this. They channel it all the time. And so I resonate with, with the spirit. And that's, that's why I like Kesh. I felt his heart was in the right place. His goal was, was correct, right? And if we don't have it yet, it might mean that we're not quite mature enough to handle it as a, as a being. But, we can solve all physical problems with li limitless energy. Right? But, the one, the, but the important problem to solve is, is ourselves, our spirits, and, and, and especially waking up to, that we are each other. And then it just comes. We'll get free energy for free. Hi, could you elaborate a little bit more on the graphene uh, part of the interface? And where, where is that coming from, the graphene? Okay. So I noticed they were using graphene in the nanobubble studies. And since I had nanobubble the ball lightning on the brain the whole time, right? I'm doing research. I said, man, wouldn't it be cool if we could just trap it in there? They trapped the nanobubbles. And graphene is, is uh, not a, is, is a, is, um, dielectric. And so you could trap in cavities. Uh, you could trap the, if you can trap the nanobubbles, could you trap the plasmoids? And to make the plasmoids, you hit it with a, with a big pulse. So the, this basically was a vision of like what future free energy devices could actually look like. Where, where they look like these solid state black type uh, conductors that seem to have this power on them. Right? And I really believe Kesh has, has the same vision because he describes it in flowery terms, microscopic suns, he calls it, right? And so I, I, that's what I resonated with. I resonated with the vision. I said, well, that's the nanoscopic or microscopic ball lightning trapped in the material. So I, I, what I read into the cache material, this was the intent. This is what was supposed to be made in the material, and that's the goal. Okay, I have a historical sequencing kind of a question for you. The, uh, in his uh, Energy from the Vacuum book, the big book by Tom Bearden, he has a section on the uh, Floyd Sweet device, and it's a very speculative uh, section. I mean, he talks about the negative resistance, but he doesn't uh, give any answers about the uh, the hardware, uh, so but you're you're telling us that in fact it was 1994 when Mr. Watson uh, figured all that out and made public. So uh, isn't the big black book come after 94? Why didn't Tom Bearden put it in that book? I asked Don Donnie Watson after after Sparky died. He died a year and a half after I met with him. He finally passed away. And then they gathered up the engineers, including Donnie, and I said, why, why didn't you tell them about the freezing trick, right? And he says, well, they were so dominant, and I just let them do their thing, and they acted like they knew it all, and, and I, I didn't chime up. He didn't, he didn't tell them. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, why didn't Tom Bearden, in, in his book, uh, write down this story that you're now verbally telling us about uh, uh, Watson rediscovering the secret? Because it's my story. Tom <laughs> Beard did not experience Donnie Watson at dinner, even though Tom, I think Tom Bearden was at, the, at that conference. This is what Donnie shared with me. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, so this was not a highlight of that 1994 conference. This is something that 
you sort of gleaned and stashed back in your memory banks. Yeah, the, the, the fact was we had the retreat before the conference. That's when I first met Donnie Watson. And it pays to share your food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. You gotta, he didn't tell Don, Tom, he didn't tell Tom Beard the story. I'm curious, has anyone ever looked at uh, in, any comparison between the nanobubble research and uh, Wilhelm Reich's uh, orgone energy, whether he used any uh, nanobubble technology? Um, looks like you're the first <laughs> to, to do the idea. The nanobubble really, the revolution didn't really start till 2006, 2000 time, uh, time frame. When the laser measurements occurred, uh, primarily in Japan, where they truly measured, measured their existence and measured their stability. Prior to that, nobody believed it was possible that water would, would, would hold a stable cluster like that. It, it was liquid, right? Nobody in the water community believed that. And today, they still don't. Right? They, still, they still have, they still are arguing with each other, but the measurements are winning the day They're, because they, they, they can see it. So most of the community in the water community have come on board. So it must be there. There are many new theories trying to explain it, but they're not happy yet because no, nobody has a really convincing theory that they all like. I don't have a question because Moray and I are completely on the same sheet of music. What I have is an invitation for tonight's presentation. We're going to have the Perkins rotor device that I built. They were actually able to create the nano cavitation and get the nano bubbles that he is referring to. So you'll actually see the device that I built and the methodology how we were able to create these micro cavitations. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Norm. Looking forward to that presentation. Where, where is that going to be? Here, here in this room? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, hi. Um, I had a question about the Keshi generator. Is it working? Um, I heard they're producing 1,000 units a day in Italy. Um, any, any reports on how well it's going, or is any other, any other prototype working of these? I, I have not heard... Uh, working devices claimed by, by, the, by the hobbyists that are replicating the, the project. I know a few that, that were, were mad that nothing really worked for them. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm waiting, right? I, I, think, I think it's the future. I, th I think that this idea is a good idea. I was surprised not to see anybody talk about the importance of giving it a high voltage pul pulse to kick start it. That's the part I, I, that's missing. And it, it, it clearly should be uh, uh, stated, right? That's how, you gonna, how else are you going to get the, pl uh, the plasma started in yeah. those cavities? They, they said they produced a million units last year. So I'm, what, they're just missing that piece, I guess, <laughs> on all those units. Well, I, I think it's a little bit premature to make a million if nobody else can replicate water, right? <laughs> 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 we might not have the specs exactly right, right? Just <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Joseph from Australia. So in regards to the Keshi technology, I have a friend in Australia who is replicating his own versions and making his own GANs to coat nano coat his uh, devices. And he's making all little strange little Keshi ones and things you can point at sore spots on your knee. And uh, he had his Keshi wired directly into his mains on his house and um, got 240 volts going through it and he said, touch it. And I said, no man, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> and he goes, no, it just gives you a little tingle. So I'm standing there with my hand on 240 volts with this t little tingle and I uh, couldn't quite understand. He explained bits and pieces to me. I know absolutely nothing about how and why it works except for the fact that he's claiming that it's reducing his power bill and he's considering that he's nanocoding his entire house because it's growing the GANs as it replicates its own energy. 
And, um, and so he's also got his little um, buckets in his garage with one, two volt batteries um, just running through there and he actually grows the cans in, his, in a water solution. And, um, and he's got a little cashy device in his car and he thinks that in regards to um, consciousness and Keshi um, technology, what um, Keshi was also talking about, similar sort of stuff, he thinks that uh, there was a number of times when he's put his intention into going from one place to another, put his foot on the accelerator, and then he's turned up at, this, at his destination and has no recollection of the distance in between. Oh, um, a teleportation unit? So that's his story, and he's been playing with all sorts of different technologies as well, but that's just the latest he's into. So it's possible I can get you in contact with him at some point. Wow, if, if well, like, that's, yeah. that's, that's quite a story. I, I would think that the first thing to, that you want is just make a small self-running unit to, so that it's just running on its own and maybe lighting up a bulb, and then you know, okay, it's making energy. As, uh, m most of these replications are constantly putting energy in from an external source. And, and so it's, energy demonstration is significant if you can make it self-run. Because after all, if you want to claim a new power source for humanity, it's a pretty weak energy device that can't run itself, right? It's not, not very convincing. So first things first, I think engineer something. It doesn't have to be for a lot. Uh, uh, um, how put off used to say the one watt challenge. Can you just get itself running for a watt? Well, these days, you know, if you get in our electromagnetic polluted environment, you can, amb you can rectify the ambient noise, right? <laughs> Glow yourself up. We're, we're being bathed in it. But uh, to, to make uh, the, important, the important demonstration <clears throat> is a self running unit, excuse me, <clears throat> that other people can replicate. That's what changes the world. Well, it's a small world because a friend of mine in Tucson knows somebody in Australia, and I'm pretty sure that the person in front of me is the same person that I was referred to. And uh, he has these incredible videos talking about his experiences with the Keshi devices. I purchased what he calls a Keshi pen, which is for pain. It's a coil inside of a plastic thingamajig. And then he also has a, um, a pad, a Keshi pad, a pain pad is what he calls it. I have both of them. I have them in my room if anybody wants to come and, and check it out. In regards to testimonials, I have nothing really painful, but I have a lot of chronic stuff. And it didn't, it helped me somewhat. But I had a friend who uh, was carrying a hundred pound weight and really pulled his back and was in a lot of acute pain. And using the pain pen just once, much of the pain went away. He used it a second time and it's as though the pain disappeared. And then he used it a third time about a week later and he's really been much better. So for acute pain, and also what he was talking about, this GANS, which I don't totally understand. But Keshi is now making eye drops and um, some other things, uh, nutritional uh, supplements. And he's putting this GANS into it. And what I understand about it is it balances the human, the activity in the body, that what is too high uh, becomes neutralized and what is too low then um, becomes more normalized. At least that's my understanding. And I, I did not, I mean, I don't have and he hasn't been sending out yet the um, energy generators. Okay. Okay, I guess, any comments on her? I don't know if it was a question. Okay, my question, Moray, is... Uh, if we know how to condition the barium ferrite, and do you know anyone who has recreated Floyd Sweet's device? And if not, is there a barrier that we, that we can start to make attempts on that? Or what, what knowledge do you have of that being recreated with the, with the, with the depth <coughs> of barium ferrite and charged by the Tesla coil? So, of course, after Sparky died, I thought it was gone. 
I, I, I tried to get all the information I could, and I got it into my book. And then I was so, so thrilled when I saw Brian, Brian Ahern's experience. And so he's, interact, he's interacting with, with author Manalis, who was successful at replicating it. This, in fact, that, I think that information resurrects the entire research again. Because, you know, we had Sparky, and very little, we had Donnie Watson getting the first base, wiggling a bubble and some Barry and Ferry. And then all, all of a sudden, I mean, Alice, who was doing a replication project, succeeding. And, and, and working essentially with a very competent professor, Professor Ahern, to, who's trying to explain it as best he can. And so the, the, probably the most current information on that project is from, is from uh, Brian Ahern at MIT. And, and that's why those links are up. There's some of the better talks that he has given on, on this topic. Any other questions? Any closing comments? Well, I'm I sure glad to be here. Can I, I have one question. <laughs> okay. What's that on the screen? How's the Rex What is that? I don't know. Is that? Well, play it to see what it does. Maybe it's a trunk monkey. <laughs> Is that a monk trunky? Here's under the sea, we found something out of the ordinary. What looks like white liquid is actually seawater that contains small air bubbles, which in turn produce even smaller bubbles. These so-called nanobubbles are the focus of a lot of attention, as they are part of a new system that can help restore aquatic life to a healthier state. Let's see how the nanobubbles are produced in a small water tank. A jet of water is coming out from the pump on the left. Once it's plunged into the water, this small nozzle produces micron-sized bubbles that further shrink as they travel through the water, turning into nanobubbles. Using a microscope, let's take a closer look at how the bubbles shrink down to nanosize. After a few minutes, the bubbles have gone from tens of microns to tens of nanometers. This is the carbon ceramic nozzle we saw earlier. The porous nature of the ceramic allows air to flow through. Apparently, it was impossible to produce nanobubbles with non-carbon-based ceramic. This system was developed not by a major company, but rather by a small factory run by Anzai Kantitsu. Their original technology has baffled many experts. There already existed several types of nanobubble systems, but all were complex and very costly. It wasn't too surprising that researchers were skeptical when they were first told that nanobubbles could be produced simply by sending air through a small ceramic nozzle. They never imagined it could be so easy. But demonstrations showed that nanobubbles remained in the water after the nozzle was taken out. The bubbles, which normally can't be seen with the naked eye, reflect light as they pass through a laser beam. Regular bubbles normally disappear quickly, but nanobubbles last for a long time, which is why they were detected by the laser. The researchers were convinced, and Anzai Kantetsu's discovery was put under the spotlight. According to developer Satoshi Anzai, their invention was the product of chance. え、特殊な件をお題のとちょっとベンチャーをお手伝いしてまして、その中で野菜を乾燥させるプロジェクトがあったんですね。で、うまく野菜を乾燥させるためにえ、あの、ちょうど水に反応する波長帯のセラミック
また大きなエネルギーを必要としますので、えー、もっと具体的に言えば高いプレッシャーであったりとか、えー、大きな攪拌するためのモーターであったりっていうものが必要になるんですが、えー、我々のセラミック式のものはですね、えー、先ほど映像で見ていただいたように非常に小さな力で泡を発生することができますのでそこが大きな違いだと思います。In 2011, an experiment was conducted at a seaside park near central Yokohama. The effects of nanobubbles were tested in the seawater beneath an old dock. The device consisted of propeller shaped stirrers and a bubble diffusing nozzle. It was small enough to be carried by truck and can be easily moved without the need for complex heavy machinery. The device was installed in only half a day with the work of three divers. The machine was set up at the bottom, 10 meters below the surface. Although the water looked quite clean from above, the seabed was covered with about a meter thick layer of sludge. The water was murky, and there was very little sign of aquatic life. 通常では泡というのは発生したところから水面に向かって上に上がってしまうんですが一番生物が住んでいるのは実は海の底、ボトムなんですね。そのボトムにに空気を送るためにはえー、自分の力で縮んでしまう泡ですねでその縮んだ泡が海流に乗って、えー、ヘドロの中に染み込んでいくというようなこういった泡で、えー、浄化するという浄化といいますかそういった生物たちに酸素を届けてあげるというのが非常に有効だと思います。A series of experiments took place in the sea near an aquarium also in Yokohama in 2013. This is a 100 square meter area near the mouth of Tokyo Bay with sludge piled up 50 centimeters thick at the bottom. The nanobubble device was installed on the seabed 8 meters below the surface with a long tube to supply air from above. The system is very energy efficient, working on 2200 watt current. White jet of bubbles coming out of the nozzle turns into smaller bubbles that, instead of going up, are dispersed around the bottom. Samples collected in February contain sandworms and small clams, two organisms commonly found in polluted waters. But in July, there were fewer shellfish, and some species of small shrimp were found in larger numbers. Arthropods like shrimp cannot survive in environments that are poor in oxygen. In half a year, The system had begun to show positive results. At the end of the experiment in January 2014, the aquatic life in the area had significantly changed. Various types of fish were observed near the reef, and seaweed had grown around the device. The sludge's thickness hadn't changed, but its content was different. Its surface had become porous like a sponge, and various organisms were found living inside. The nanobubbles had changed the ecosystem near the seabed. Tokyo Wan, to be honest, the people in the area of the area were living in the area of 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 the 微生物の世界でありそういったものに有効であるというのを証明できれば、えー、我々人類も自然の中で共存して生きていける社会ができるんじゃないかと思っています。Bubbles that shrink and remain underwater for a long time. Nanobubble technology is quite intriguing. The company's original and simple ceramic nozzle system can be adapted to a variety of situations. And there are plenty of sea regions around the world that can benefit from their invention, which can help bring back abundance and diversity to aquatic life across the globe. This simple little piece of ceramic could end up having a big impact on our oceans. As scientists learn more about the complex dynamics of climate change, declining oxygen levels in seawater are becoming more of a concern. Nanobubbles might be one way to blow some life back into the world's largest ecosystem. Well, that, that foreshadows tomorrow's talk,、uh, the nanobubble revolution at two at the, uh, in the COP8 uh, conference. I'll be, I'll be presenting that.
Moray, right, can I make a comment real quick? Um, this, that, that, this presentation and that, uh, that video that we just watched fills me with more hope than, than, than I can actually possibly express. As human beings, we tend to concentrate on the exact wrong problem. We are, we are very, very much aware of the deforestation of the planet, but we don't think about the over-acidification of the, the oceans. Deforestation of the planet, we can survive because, the, the, because comparatively, trees convert a lot less oxygen than the oceans do. But we very seldom think about how much the uh, acidification of the oceans is actually affecting the oxygen content that we live in. Um, much, much more oxygen is transmuted by the oceans. And what we're seeing here is, the, for me, the very first truly effective method of rebuilding our oxygen supply from the, uh, from the aquatic life up. So this fills me with a lot of hope. Thank you very much. Oh. Well said. Any other questions? I do see a hand in the back. He's been suppressed. Uh, that gentleman has been suppressed? Yes. Really? Yes. Interesting. You'd almost think that there was a vested interest in, I don't know, human life dying off. Maybe a reduction of population down to 700 million people, maybe. Did you have a question? So I don't know if you would have an answer, but regarding the nanobubble's ability to stay in the water, I know you had said that he had a container of water and the bubble stayed for over two years. Uh, but on his engine, was he moving water vapor before? I'm, I'm confusing a couple of the inventors in here. I think I'm mashing them together. But there was some way that the nanobubbles were getting into a combustion engine. And I'm wondering, was it just through the gas? Was there enough room in the water vapor and the gas in the air to hold the nanobubbles? Or was he actually putting liquid into the combustion chamber? You said Brown's gas generator? No, 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 the, uh, these nanobubbles. On, on this particular inventor? I'm, I might be confusing them together, but I think, who is, who is the guy who used the nanobubbles to run an engine? Nanobubbles to run an engine, that, right, that, that was the fog particles when they convert yeah. to ball lightning. It's, so he it's was the using ball, It's the fog. ball lightning is, when you convert over, yeah. that's where all the anomalies from the energy, the zero point energy occur. So he was While, using a fog as yeah. the fuel Fog charge. particles, right. Yeah, okay. I was just wondering if it was... Who his name was? Yeah. Oh, that was Walt Jenkins. Okay. And I think, uh, I, I, I predict he'll become the next Stan Meyer. He'll, be that, he'll become that famous for, for what he did. He's, he simplified it. That is the other thing that Keshi is working on is diminishing radiation. He's working with presumably the Japanese on the Fukushima radiation plant. Uh, yeah, we sure need help there. All right. Thank you very much. Morey King. <laughs>